SEP Fanfic Readings presents Aurelian by Biddy Blue Eyes. Chapter 20 The Imprudent Vigilante. Putter! Draco shouted, pounding on Hermione's front door. There was a shuffling inside, and the door flew open. Malfoy, what happened? Harry asked in a state of panic. I was attacked, he stated. Where's her. Harry's words were cut off by a pop and his question was answered when he looked down at the woman kneeling on the front porch with a man face down next to her. "'Is this him?' Harry asked quickly. "'I'm almost certain,' Hermione answered. "'Almost isn't good enough,' Harry replied. "'Ron, help me with him.' Draco looked up and saw the red-haired man move in front of Harry. Ron took the man's feet while Harry struggled to lift the large man's upper half. Their steps were small, and as soon as they had made it into the room, they lifted him up and flopped him over the back of the sofa. "'What happened?' Ron asked." Is it him? I think so, said Hermione. Not good enough, Ron repeated Harry's earlier statement. Incarcerous. Rope shot out of the end of Ron's wand and bound the man's hand and feet. What happened? Harry repeated. He tried to kill me, Draco growled angrily. It was obviously not the answer Harry or Ron had expected. Hermione started from the beginning. We were in the bar. He was in the bar, Hermione said, pointing at the unconscious man on her sofa. He was drinking from a tankard, but he still took a drink from a hip flask. I suspect it was polyjuice. As she said this, Ron dug into the man's cloak and found the hip flask. He followed us to the apothecary and listened in with extendable ears at Borgen and Burke's. We were leaving Nocturne Alley when Draco just stopped. He turned around and went back the other way. I couldn't keep up and I fell, and I had no idea what was happening. I didn't realize that he was under the Imperious curse. When I found both of them, he... He tried to make me kill myself. He called it justice, Draco finished. He was seething. His lip was twitching and his hands were shaking. Hermione gently sat her hand on his upper arm. He looked down at her and closed his eyes, trying to calm himself. So we know he's under polyjuice, said Harry, sniffing the flask that Ron handed him, but that doesn't mean that it's Dennis. The extendable ears, though, Hermione offered. Not many people, except those that grew up with him at school, would think to use them. And this is definitely one of Fred and George's shield cloaks, Ron announced, examining the hem of the man's cloak. I agree, but we still have to be careful. Hermione, put the pictures down. I don't want him to know whose home this is, Harry requested. Hermione nodded and from her place behind the sofa swished her wands and all of the photos, magic and non, flipped over. Where's his wand? Ron asked. I have it, Hermione offered, handing the wand over to Ron. What about the cloak? Harry worried suddenly. I have that too, Hermione said. Hermione had blushed when she reached behind her and took out the cloak. She had told Draco to leave, but she didn't know what to do with everything, so she simply stuffed the cloak halfway into her shorts, and it had been swinging behind like a tail. No one but Hermione saw anything strange about it. "'When did he take the polyjuice?' inquired Draco. Hermione checked her watch. "'He'll be changing in just a few minutes. I tried to time it well.' "'All right,' Harry said heavily. He had been more worried about finding Dennis than just about everything the past few days, but finally having him there, and knowing what he'd been up to, Harry was peeved. He pushed the man up into a sitting position and trained his wand on him. Renovate. The man startled awake and his eyes darted around. Who are you? Harry demanded instantly. The man's eyes focused on the raven-haired, bespectacled man before him. Harry Potter? The rugged, red-beard man breathed. Yes, and I asked who you were, Harry said firmly. D Dennis, the gruff man stuttered. Dennis who? Harry pressed. He was taking no chances. C -c -c Creevy. Prove it, Harry ordered. What? The man was so fierce and confident only a few minutes before in the alley, suddenly looked nervous and uncertain. Prove it. What happened to you on your first trip to Hogwarts? Harry demanded. I, I fell into the lake. The squid saved me. Harry and Ron exchanged looks and nodded. Ron released the ropes around Dennis's arms and legs. Harry just stared at him. Dennis watched him anxiously as he rubbed his wrists, unsure what to make of Harry's continued silence. "'Where am I? What happened?' Dennis asked. "'What happened? You tried to fucking kill me, you bloody little coward. I should snap your flippin—' "'What is he doing here?' Dennis shouted with both outrage and fear. Since Draco and Hermione had been behind him, he hadn't noticed them until Draco spoke. "'Me? I'm here be—' "'Malfoy,' Harry interrupted, his face set in hard lines. His buried anger was so strong that it was almost tangible. He looked rather frightening in this unpredictable state.' Draco became silent. His curiosity to see what Potter would do trumped his own anger for the moment. Malfoy is here by invitation. He's been working with us, Harry explained calmly. 
You still work with him. He's a Death Eater. I saw him. You should have seen him in Nocturnawi. He was... I did see him, Hermione interrupted angrily. I saw everything he did from the moment he stepped into Nocturnalley until we apparated here. He did only what we had previously discussed. What? But he... But I what? I had a drink in a bar, bought some rabbit spleens, and settled my father's old accounts, Draco raged. What are you accusing me of? You tried to kill me, you bloody wanker. You want justice? Then I... Stop, Harry said calmly. No need for debates. He's been working with us. The suspicious-looking activity was meant to draw you out. We assumed you would follow him. Harry stopped there. Everyone could tell that he had meant to keep going, but thought better of it. What do you mean you were trying to draw me out? Dennis asked, looking quite sour. Harry didn't think the look fit the body he was in at all. Just as he thought it, Dennis's skin began to bubble. His muscle and bones shifted and shrank. The people around him, though they had seen transformations many times before, turned their heads. When they looked back, they were staring at a scrawny-looking 18-year-old boy with brown hair and fierce hazel eyes. Though he was frightened and his emotions were torn, his eyes held a certain light of defiance. "'We've been looking for you. We were working on a case and discovered that you were missing, which was quite a surprise to your parents and your headmistress,' Harry said. Dennis paled quickly. "'My parents think I'm missing?' "'Yes. After I spoke with Professor McGonagall, she went to speak to your parents personally.' I'm surprised that you would do this to them after all that they had been through, Harry admonished in a flat voice. You don't know anything about it, Dennis shouted angrily. Don't I? Do you think I don't know what it's like to lose people to war? Harry's control was slipping rapidly, his words getting louder and more heated. You don't think I'm angry with those that caused all the suffering. It's my job. It's what I've dedicated my life to. I know what you're doing. I know that you're hunting Death Eaters, and I want to know— what the hell is wrong with you? What do you mean by that? Dennis demanded indignantly. I mean, what the hell were you thinking dropping out of school like that? Telling no one where you were going? Running off to chase after Death Eaters? The most idiotic thing I've heard in ages, Harry berated. You have no right to scold me, Dennis returned angrily. Yes, I do. I was the one that had to track you down. Our investigation had to be paused so we could find you— the four of us have spent the last few days exhausting ourselves just to find you. Your family, teachers, friends had no idea where you were and are still scared out of their minds right now. How do you think they'd feel if you showed up dead? Or not even at all? You were stupid. Stupid and careless. I wasn't stupid. I was careful. I knew what I was doing, he declared. Bullshit. We found you in less than a week, Harry said incredulously. And you're lucky we did. Careful, you say. You confronted what you thought was a Death Eater. What if he was? What if he was someone other than Hermione under that cloak? You'd be dead right now. What if he was? Dennis said in disbelief. He is! He was. He isn't now, Carrie corrected. Because you forgave him. You let him go, Dennis growled angrily. I let him defend himself and work off his crimes. But you don't know his case. What he has or hasn't done. You have no right to judge what you don't know. Not everything is as black or white as you'd like to believe, but you should believe it now. I thought you were a good kid, and you think you're fighting the good fight, but you just used an unforgivable curse to try and kill an innocent man. Dennis chanced a glance at the man who still shook angrily behind him and looked back at Harry. He suddenly looked more concerned. Wha what are you going to do? Me? I don't know what I'm going to do, he cried in a helpless frustration, pacing in a small circle with his bald fist on his hips. He turned back and faced Dennis. Yes, I do know what I'm going to do, at least right now. You're going to tell me what you know. I want to know what you saw and heard. What? what? Dennis asked, not expecting this response. I need to know what you saw. What got you started on this whole vigilante idea? You saw Lestrange, didn't you? Where? Harry interrogated. How? How did you know? It's my job to know, remember? He said bitterly. Now talk. But wait, what's going to happen to me? Dennis asked nervously. He chanced another glance at Draco and Hermione, and then looked to Ron. He didn't feel hopeful speaking to Harry. I don't know, Harry replied honestly. I'd like to not see a kid like you in trouble, but it's not really in my hands. I'm not going to say a thing about your unforgivable curse. It's that man you should be pleading with, Harry said seriously, pointing at Draco, who was scowling down at Dennis. It's up to him whether he wants this taken to court. Dennis swallowed hard and looked up at Draco, the full weight of his actions pressing down on him. He understood what he had done and was positively terrified. I... I... 
He couldn't speak. There were no words. Do you want me to think with your sense of justice? Or Potter's? Draco asked derisively, staring down at the boy in disgust. I... He was shaking under Draco's scowl. Dennis, Harry said, calling the boy's attention back to him. Talk. Dennis swallowed hard and nodded. He thought that maybe it was what Draco meant. Perhaps if we could help, he could make up for his actions. He looked back at Draco again. His fate depended on the man he had just tried to kill. Dennis, Harry called again. Dennis looked at Harry and took a deep breath. I... I was in the cemetery, the memorial cemetery, when I saw him. Who? Ron asked. The Lestranges. The brothers, Dennis clarified. When? Hermione asked. A few weeks before the end of school. I had snuck out at night. I, I went to see Colin, Dennis answered. When I got there, there were two men. I didn't know who they were. I just saw that they were digging at someone's grave. I wanted to just leave, but I got angry. I thought, if it had been Colin's grave... Whatever grave they were messing with, someone loved that person. I just wanted to get close enough to see if I could identify them. And? Draco probed. And I realized who they were and I panicked. I just hid until they left. But I had heard them talking. I didn't hear much, but I had heard them talk about picking something up on Tuesday near Brim's Goblet. I went back to the school and just started thinking. I was angry. And the more I thought about it, the angrier I got. I wanted to punish them. Why didn't you go to the authorities? Hermione asked in frustration. You could have gone straight to Harry if you wanted to. I... Dennis looked away, unable to speak what he felt. You wanted them to suffer, Harry declared. Dennis was startled by Harry's accusation, mostly because it was true. Don't think that I haven't had that same feeling. But causing people to suffer because of the things they've done isn't justice. It's revenge. Azkaban didn't seem like harsh enough punishment to you. But now that the possibility awaits you, how do you feel about it? Draco asked him darkly. Judgments should not be made by people who are biased. Whose? Ron asked suddenly, surprising them all. Whose grave were they digging at? Dennis looked up at Harry. The defiance that had been in his eyes earlier had washed away. He looked truly miserable and remorseful, but greater still. He looked like he dreaded answering the next question. Nymphadora Tonks. Dennis's concern for their reaction was not without reason. Harry's fists were clenched tightly and he looked to be struggling to contain himself again, Dennis watched all of the meaningful looks between the four people who stood above him. "'We're done here,' Harry said finally. "'What do you mean? What's going to happen?' Dennis asked in a panic. "'We're going to work, and you're going home,' Harry said. "'What? I, I can just go home?' Dennis asked hopefully. "'I told you. Your problem was with him, not me,' Harry reminded him. It was completely the truth. Harry didn't want to see Dennis punished for an unforgivable curse, but it was not in his hands.' Whatever punishment Dennis received, it was on his own head. Harry could think this so firmly only because it was his belief that Dennis would not suffer full punishment. Mal, Dra uh, Mr. Malfoy, Dennis said uncertainly. Draco sneered in disgust, shoved his hands in his pockets, and turned his back on the bumbling idiot. The room went silent for a moment, everyone's eyes on Draco's back. When it appeared that Draco had nothing to say on the matter, Harry began to speak. But Harry had barely made a sound when Draco forced out, Judgments aren't to be made by the biased. He whipped around and looked Harry hard in the eye. Justice, Potter, not mercy. I put it on you. Fix him right. Never before that week would Harry have believed Draco possible of making such a decision, but it was a testament to how life-changing the memories had been to them. He had a new respect for Malfoy, and with that came faith, a faith that Malfoy also had in him. He knew that Draco saw a piece of him in Dennis, Draco's situation was not much like Dennis's because Dennis made his decisions without being threatened. But Draco still saw a stupid, confused kid like he was just two years before. Draco didn't want Dennis to get away with what he did, but the kid didn't deserve to spend the rest of his life in prison either. He knew that Potter felt the same. Harry had given Draco a second chance, and Draco would let him do the same for Dennis. Harry also saw a lot of himself in Dennis, probably more than Draco did. Knowing what he did, being in the place he was... Harry could easily see all of Dennis's mistakes and berate him for it, but he had played the role of careless vigilante through all of his teen years, even before then. He had often thought he had that right, and that he knew better than others. The truth was he had only survived the way he did as long as he did, because of a lot of luck and mercy. Ron, Harry said, I need you to work up some papers for me. Dennis is now under house arrest for interfering with an official investigation, and will remain under it until his disciplinary hearing. What does that mean? Dennis asked. 
It means Harry and Malfoy just saved your sorry arse from rotting in Azkaban, Ron piped up. If I were you, I'd start looking through a catalog for some nice gift baskets to send. Or, owling your headmistress about rescheduling your NEWTs, Harry suggested. You taking him home then, Harry? Ron asked. Yes, I'll be back in less than an hour, I hope, he told Hermione and Draco. We'll be here then, Hermione answered. Harry waited until Draco looked his way and caught his eye. Harry nodded slowly and meaningfully with appreciation and respect. Draco's curt nod in reply was almost non-existent. It could have easily been mistaken as merely a twitch, but Harry had seen it. He took Dennis by the upper arm, drug him outside of Hermione's front door, and disapparated. When Harry had left, Ron swiped the discarded hip flask from the armchair to take it to the office as evidence. He looked at Hermione and Draco and rolled his eyes. They were doing nothing but standing there watching him. Simply the idea of the two of them together repulsed him. He stopped and eyed Draco with curious scrutiny. After a strange and uncomfortable moment, Ron nodded to Draco and headed toward the front door. See you at dinner tonight, Hermione? I'll be there. With a final nod, Ron walked out the door and disapparated with a pop. Are you okay? Hermione asked, turning to Draco. I'm fine, Draco said darkly. No, I mean it, Hermione said, gently placing her hand on his arm again. Are you okay? Draco sighed, dropping his hard defenses, and nodded. Hermione tilted her head to the side to examine his neck. You're already bruising. I'll go get you some ointment and something for the pain, she quietly offered. Just as she started turning away, Draco took hold of her wrist to stop her. She was surprised and looked up at him. His eyes were locked on hers, and she saw the deep pain inside them. I'm sorry I yelled at you, he said solemnly. She smiled at him softly. It's okay. No, it's not, he said seriously. It's okay, Draco, I understand. You were scared. I was scared. At the admittance of her fear again, her lip quivered and her eyes began to water. I was really scared. As she stared into his expressive gray eyes, she was overwhelmed again. It was all happening so fast. They had barely tolerated each other a week before, never imagining that there could be anything beyond basic tolerance. But as the days moved on, she found herself wanting to see him more and more, waiting for when she would see him next. Still, he had seemed possibly just a new fascination. It really hit her when she saw him in the alley, clutching his own throat. She had been positively horrified. It was pure terror at first. She would have felt that way if she had seen anyone in Draco's position. But once she had saved him, the magnitude of it hit her. She had almost lost him. It seemed a silly thought, because she didn't really have him yet. But she knew that it was anything but silly. The thought of never seeing him again had devastated her. What she was fine without before had become a necessity. She couldn't say that she loved him yet, but he meant a lot. She didn't know what. There were no words to describe it. He was simply hers, and she would be devastated without him. Looking into his eyes, though, it made her feel quite presumptuous, and she believed he shared those feelings. Hermione glanced down at her wrist, which he was holding, and he relinquished at once. Hermione raised her hand and gently cupped his cheek. It was far too late to protect her heart from him. She was already in much deeper than she had imagined. She lifted herself up and gently guided him down until their lips touched in a tender, delicate kiss. She pulled away and smiled warmly at him. She petted his cheek and blushed lightly. I'll go get the ointment. Hermione? Harry called through the flat as he stepped through the front door. In here, Harry, she called back. Harry walked into the kitchen and found Hermione and Draco at the table eating. Sorry, we didn't think you'd be back so soon, Hermione apologized. We can go if you're ready, though, Draco told him. No, it's fine. I didn't know you two hadn't eaten yet, he replied. Have you? asked Hermione. Uh, yeah, Ron and I kind of stole your leftover Chinese food, Harry admitted, rubbing the back of his neck guiltily. I can pay you back if you want. I- No, Harry, it's fine, Hermione chuckled. I'm glad you ate it, actually. It probably would have gone to waste otherwise. So, how did it go? Harry sighed and leaned against her counter. All right, I guess. I made him tell his parents what he'd been doing. They were quite angry, as you can imagine. I didn't make him tell about what happened in the alley. I didn't feel it was my place, he explained. I assured them that we were searching for the same people he was. I told them that we didn't believe they knew about Dennis, but that we were setting up protective wards around their house. I also set up the ward so that he can't leave the property. His parents seemed quite pleased with that part, but they're quite nervous about his disciplinary hearing. I told them that when they received the owl about the hearing, it would also give them information on how to contact someone who could come and explain everything to them. Hermione nodded. What about your meeting at Gringotts today? How did that go? 
Hermione was standing at her open icebox, pouring himself a glass of pumpkin juice, and paused when she asked her question. He huffed as he put the bottle back into the icebox and closed the door. I hate goblins. Greedy bastards. The whole lot of them. Harry, that's not fair, Hermione admonished. You can't judge a whole species based on... Fine. All the goblins I've ever met are stupid, greedy bastards, Harry amended with a roll of his eyes. I told them that the information I wanted on Mr. Parkinson was in no way for my own gain. I was asking for it because I was concerned for the safety of the family. Whether they believed me or not, they didn't at all seem concerned about the point of it. They looked like they couldn't care less about their client's safety. I told them that I didn't need to see their vault, know their vault number, any balances, or even account deposits or withdrawals. I told them that the only thing I was interested in was the log of all the times that Mr. Parkinson had entered the bank in the last six months. And what did they say? Draco asked curiously. Well, they certainly seemed surprised. I understand how protective they are about the privacy of their clients, so I knew to ask for as little as possible. To them, this request is not personal information at all. If someone had wanted to, they could have stood outside the door every day and made the log I was asking for. It's not secret. But as soon as they realized my request was reasonable, they immediately asked what I was willing to give in exchange for the information, Harry grumbled. They will never be helpful without reward, and usually a quite outrageous reward. What did you offer? asked Hermione. Well, I took Bill's advice. He wasn't there today, but from when I spoke to him yesterday, he said to avoid bargaining with goods, especially gold and valuables. There are several reasons behind that. So I took his advice again and went to the Goblin Liaison Office and requested to look at each of their files. There are three of them in on this, by the way. It turns out that one of them, Krubat, has an issue filed there. It seems that he was turned down by a witch for a place of residence because he's a goblin. The way things are run there, complaints against goblins are usually put first, so files like Krubat's usually take a few months to get to. I asked Wayne Hopkins, who works in that division now, if it was possible to move a case up if I asked, and he said it wouldn't be a problem, so that's what I offered. And, Hermione prompted, and they told me that they would have to think it over, and they'd get back to me, Harry answered. Bill says that's a good sign. They weren't able to haggle with me. It was definitely something that would interest Krubat. Goblins never agree without giving an offer its due consideration. And most likely, Bill said, Krubat's going to have to make some extra bargaining with the other two. Still, he told me to be ready for their acceptance tomorrow. That's good, said Draco. He was quite anxious to get to the bottom of the Parkinson thing. Obviously, they believed the Parkinsons were being threatened for money. It wasn't the only possibility, but the most likely in their opinions, and also the easiest to investigate. Would you like some more, or are you finished? Hermione asked, gesturing at Draco's empty plate. No, I'm finished, thank you. And I'm ready to go when you are, he said to Harry. Hermione nodded in agreement. All right, let's go then, Harry said, setting his empty cup in the sink. Hermione and Draco followed after. Once outside her door, he turned to face them. I'll meet you at the gate. Hermione apparated first, arriving only seconds before them. The three soon stood at a large iron-gated arbor at the entrance to the War Memorial Cemetery on the outskirts of Hogsmeade. The decorative arch was just that, a decoration, as the rest of the cemetery boundary was marked by a short hedge. The cemetery had been constructed only a few short days after Voldemort's defeat. There had been losses on both sides, but that cemetery was the resting place for those that had bravely fought to restore the peace, as well as the innocent victims of Voldemort and the Death Eaters during Voldemort's second reign. There had been families that preferred that their loved ones come to rest in the family cemeteries, but the overwhelming majority had been proud to have their loved ones honored at the War Memorial Cemetery. The original plan was for it to be quite a small cemetery, but as the numbers of those lost in those three years were tallied, the cemetery had expanded to hold over a hundred plots. Colin's grave is over there, Harry directed, pointing to a place not far to their right. He started moving toward it, and Tonks and Lupin are in the back row over there. Harry pointed toward the back left row. So, if he had been kneeling on Colin's grave, they wouldn't have seen him very easily. He said he got closer then. He would have had to move quite far if he was able to identify, wouldn't he? How could he be sure? If I were in his position, said Hermione, I would have crawled in front of the gravestones and hidden behind the obelisk. It wouldn't be a lot of movement, and he'd have more cover. I think it would be close enough. Harry followed Hermione's suggested path on foot. He walked six graves toward the left and two back and found himself standing in front of the structure at the center of the cemetery. It was a monument dedicated to all of the people who fought in the war, a smooth six-foot black stone obelisk upon a two-foot plinth that read, We Will Never Forget. He peered around the edge of it and found that Hermione was right. 
It was still a bit of a distance from Tonk's grave, but Dennis would have been able to count gravestones and possibly identify the Lestrange brothers. They were, after all, very memorable people. It would be difficult to misidentify them. He wasn't trying to prove that Dennis's account was false. He wanted to believe him, but the investigator in him needed to prove that Dennis's story was possible. Therefore, he needed to try to disprove it. He was quite relieved to find no flaws. Okay, let's go. Harry led the way again through the graves, this time toward the back left. He stopped and looked sadly down at the graves of Nymphador Tonks Lupin and Remus John Lupin. He didn't think it mattered how much time would pass. It would always hurt to visit them here. All right, Hermione, let's have a look. Hermione pulled out her wand and knelt beside the grave. Wait, Draco said quickly. Have a look? You don't mean you're going to... Hermione looked a little confused for a moment, and then her eyes widened in understanding. What? No! No, we're not going to... to dig or anything. Merlin, no. Hermione's quite skilled with a spell for ultrasonic sight, Harry explained. At Draco's confusion, he tried to explain a little better. It's like an ultrasound machine. Harry realized that that was no help at all once he said it. Hermione? Hermione sighed and rolled her eyes. Harry and Ron both preferred working with her over the other people in her department, and when asked why by their peers, they loved to talk up her abilities. At first, it was just explaining their decision, but then it sort of turned into bragging rights because Hermione, no matter how busy she was, seemed to find a few minutes to help either of them with something special. The funny part of it all to her was that Harry and Ron only understood what she was trying to accomplish half of the time and could hardly ever find a way to explain it to others. Ultrasonic waves are a high-frequency sound wave. The spell I use sends out those waves, then it accepts the sound back and creates an image in my mind, she explained. See, um, well, take this as an example. We know that Tonks, like most here, was cremated. Her remains are in a small metal box. If I send the sound into the ground, the ground will resonate at a certain frequency, and the metal will resonate at its own frequency, and the ashes will be quite different still. The sound will be received in order and in time so that it can map out a rather basic but accurate idea of what is there without having to actually look. Does that make sense? Yes, but where did you even learn to do a thing like that? Draco asked bewilderedly. Madame Pomfrey, actually, Hermione answered. In the muggle world, ultrasound machines are primarily used for medical diagnostics. Madame Pomfrey pioneered its use in the magical world. She had the idea and it took her over a decade to perfect, but she had quite a few test subjects also. When I found she was able to do it, I thought it could be very useful in detection on the field. Brilliant, isn't it? Harry asked. Yeah, Draco agreed, looking rather impressed. Hermione blushed and purposely kept her head bent so that they could not see it. It definitely has come in handy a few times, but it only works if I can concentrate and in the environment is quiet. Sorry, Harry and Draco apologized together. Hermione closed her eyes and concentrated as she slowly moved her wand back and forth over the grave concentrating on a small square patch. Her wand slowed to a stop and she sighed, her shoulders slumping. She looked up at Harry and shook her head. The ground is solid and compacted around the box. It hasn't been touched since it was buried. The ground in front of it is looser, though. It fits with Dennis's story about being dug up recently, but there's no necklace. They took it, or else someone had taken it before them. Do you think it's a horcrux? Harry asked. None of them had asked it before then. He was rather sure that in no one else having asked, that they all assumed the same thing. It's my guess, yes, Hermione answered. We can't know for sure with the information we have, but it seems likely. Bellatrix received the opal necklace around the same time she had gone off with Voldemort. It's no secret that he valued her above the others. We know that she had to learn about Horcruxes somewhere. I believe that she learned it from him then. It's also something that she valued very much, not to mention... Why else would Rodolphus and Rebastian feel the need to take it? I agree, but how do we know? And if it is, is it still a horcrux, or has she already been restored to a body? Harry asked. The three of them pondered it quietly. Her wand, Draco answered. We know that she has her own wand again in the memories. Hermione even has it in her possession now, but the wand was buried with Bellatrix's remains, just as the necklace was with Nymphadora. Hermione stood and smiled at Draco. It's definitely something to consider. You know where she's buried? Yes, it's in the Black Family Cemetery, said Draco. He extended an arm to Hermione and the other to Harry. They nodded and took hold. Draco closed his eyes and concentrated before disapparating. When the three of them opened their eyes, they were standing in a different graveyard. This one was much larger, and they were able to easily look out over it from their place at the back of the tree line. The cemetery was clearly several centuries old. 
They could tell from where they were that it was organized by time. The graves at the very front were much older, many of them severely weathered, and at the back where they stood were the more recent graves. Right here, said Draco, leading them down a few paces. He stopped at a small gravestone that simply read, Bellatrix Lestrange, nay black, March 28, 1951, May 2, 1998. There was no wish of rest in peace or a heartfelt epitaph. She simply was and was not. At least, that was what it seemed by the look of her grave. In truth, it was anything but simple. Hermione swallowed hard and approached the grave. It felt nothing like what she had just performed over Tonks's grave. It felt much heavier, darker. She apprehensively knelt beside it and closed her eyes. Her hand was a little unsteady at first, and she scolded herself for her nervousness. There was nothing special about the task. It wasn't a person in there. There were the ashes of a body that was once a person, nothing more. With new determination, her wand moved slowly over the grassy soil. She opened her eyes and got to her feet and dusted off her knees before looking at Draco and Harry. It's not there. It looks just like Tonks's grave. The soil around the box is firm, but the ground in front of it has been turned up more recently. There's no wand there, she stated matter-of-factly. While it's certainly something helpful to know, it still doesn't tell us whether the Horcrux had been used, and whether it was still houses her soul, Draco said with mild frustration. It had been his idea, and he had hoped it would somehow answer their questions, but it only caused him greater fear to know that her wand had already been retrieved. The three of them fell into deep thought, chasing the same thoughts around their brains over and over again. Hermione stared at Bellatrix's headstone with determination, and it suddenly hit her. Bone of the father, she breathed quietly. Harry, if she learned about Horcruxes from Voldemort, what if she also learned how to come back from one? What if she followed the same ritual? Bone of the father unknowingly given, Harry said, looking at Hermione in stunned disbelief. Her father's grave, where is it? Just over there, Draco announced. He started leading them a few graves down and stopped suddenly. Hermione and Harry stepped to the side to see what he was looking at. There, in front of them, was overturned dirt on a grave that no one had bothered to recover. Harry's eyes followed up the grave to the headstone that read, Cygnus Black the Third. That's him, isn't it? Harry asked. Was Cygnus her father? Draco nodded. My grandfather. There's no question now, Hermione said quietly. This proves it in my book. There's no way that this could all be a coincidence. She's back. Harry stared, unblinking, at the grave. His face was a stone. It's not good news, but we already knew that it was not only possible, but likely. We're not wondering anymore. We have an answer, and now we plan. Hermione nodded. It's time to plan. My place, Harry offered. Draco nodded. You can apparate directly outside the front door. Draco watched the other two disapparate and took one last look at his grandfather's grave before joining them. When he arrived, the front door of the Grimmauld Place was open, and Hermione was waiting expectantly inside the threshold. Draco smiled softly at her and entered. "'Welcome home, Master Harry,' Creature greeted. "'And Master has guests. May Creature bring tea?' "'No, but maybe some pumpkin juice,' answered Harry. "'Is that all, Master?' Creature asked. "'Um,' Harry thought for a moment. "'I'm going to the Weasleys for dinner tonight. Maybe—' "'Could you please make a couple of pies for dessert?' "'Yes, Master.' Creature replied with a great smile. Harry sighed. He felt bad asking favors of the house elf, but it seemed to mean so much to him. In the sitting room, Hermione glanced at Draco and walked beside him as they followed Harry. Harry stood in the middle of the room, making no move to sit, so Hermione took a seat on the sofa, looking at him uncertainly. Draco sat beside her, made nervous by Potter's edgy demeanor. We need to plan, Harry repeated, rubbing his head in frustration. But I don't even know where to start. We start with basic objectives. Hermione stated. We need to kill her, Draco declared simply. Hermione was a little taken aback. Well, they will probably use killing curses toward us, and we do have permission to use killing curses on Death Eaters that are still at large in the country, but our objective is to capture her. Not probably, Hermione. They will use unforgivables the second they see you. You cannot hesitate, Draco insisted. Agreed, Harry said firmly. And she's already dead, Hermione, so there's no ethics involved. Hermione nodded, but still took the conversation in the other direction. In the memories, we strongly believe that after she returned, she made a new Horcrux, so we need to know if she's already made a new Horcrux or not. Draco did not respond. Hermione wasn't sure that he had even listened to the last part. He was still staring at her with nettled doubt. She would need to commit murder to make a Horcrux. There have been no recent murders, Harry stated. 
There have been no known recent murders in the wizarding world, but we really don't know about the muggle world. She could have picked any random person, Hermione reasoned. That would be a good place to start. I'll ask my mom about recent news and watch the news on TV in the evening. I bet my parents have at least a week's worth of newspapers. Good, said Harry. What else? Potter, Draco said seriously. I need to speak with my mother. Harry and Hermione both looked a bit surprised. She has a reason to fear Bellatrix. In the memory, it looked like there was no hesitation for her to kill my mother. She has to know, Draco explained. Yes, Harry agreed. What may I tell her? Draco continued. So long as we can trust her to be silent, anything, Harry said, surprising Hermione. Thank you, Draco replied solemnly. Would you like me to be there? Harry offered. Actually, yes, Draco admitted. She needs to know that this is serious. I don't want her to doubt it. Do, do you want me to... to? No, Draco answered quickly. He saw the frightened and injured look on Hermione's face and rushed to explain. This is going to be overwhelming for her. I don't know how she'll take it. And... And I'm going to tell her about Aurelian. I think it might be better if you weren't there when I explain that part to her. It's not against you. I just... I understand, Hermione assured him. It was very difficult for her to explain the bare minimum to her parents, and it didn't go well. It was frightening to imagine if she had Draco there with her when she had explained. That had to go two ways. Tomorrow, Potter. For dinner? Draco asked. Yeah, just give me details tomorrow, Harry agreed, like it was not at all concerning to him. Now, back to the plan. 